Without too much further ado, what I really want to do is introduce our first speaker. Uh, in a speech called Cannabis 101, an introduction to the history, botany and chemistry, which is going to be incredibly interesting and he's a lovely bloke too. Uh, Justin Sinclair. Justin has spent decades exploring the diverse field of herbal medicines around the world from both scientific and traditional perspective. His qualifications include a Bachelor of Health Science from the University of New England, a Master's of Herbal Medicine from the Faculty of Pharmacy at Sydney University, and diplomas in Nutrition and Herbal Medicine. Uh, key areas of study in his Master's degree included toxicology, pharmacognosy, analytical phytochemistry, medicinal botany, and pharmaceutical technology. How good was that sentence, by the way? I practiced that for a long time. Uh, well, you got it when you're a layperson. Uh, working in education since 2003, Justin has taught across a wide variety of subject matter. He has also worked as a technical consultant in the uh, complementary healthcare industry since 2006 in the fields of new product design, regulatory affairs, and research and development. Justin has been published in peer-reviewed journals and textbooks on the topics of herbal medicine, pain management, and herb-drug interactions, has been an executive director and examiner for the National Herbalist Association of Australia, and currently sits on the scientific advisory board for both United in Compassion and Bioceuticals. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our first speaker, Justin Sinclair. Thanks for the kind introduction, Tim, and uh, God sitting through those introductions is painful. I'll try and live up to even a quarter of that. But good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm incredibly excited to be able to talk to you today about a topic that has been far too long in coming to the forefront of public debate and represents a relatively unknown and greatly underutilized chapter in our recent medical and pharmacological history. As a lecturer in the field of pharmacognosy and botany for the last 10 years, I've been patiently waiting for such a time to rise. So it gives me great pleasure to be able to have the privilege to talk to you today. Not only am I excited, but absolutely humbled to be able to listen to the amazing collection of speakers that have flown from all over the world to be here to share their knowledge at this time in the evolution of medicinal cannabis in this great country of ours. So for the push for the use of medicinal cannabis for Australian patients suffering a wide range of serious medical conditions has been a very long and arduous road. And it's largely because of the tidal wave of public support from people like you that this has actually come so far so quickly. A 2015 poll conducted by Roy Morgan Research suggests that 91% of Australians are in support of medicinal cannabis for those that need it. And on behalf of the countless patients, their families, friends, carers and advocacy groups, we sincerely thank you for your continuing interest and heartfelt support. And based on that heartfelt support, the Australian Government has taken its first steps to passing legislation for the growing and manufacturing of medicinal cannabis earlier this year, with support from most political parties. And for this, we also need to thank our Government representatives for keeping an open mind and heart and listening to the needs of those that are suffering. This being said, we can't rest on our laurels quite yet, as it is really now that the hard work begins. We now have an incredible opportunity to reinstate this plant to our medicinal pharmacopoeias, dispel the inaccuracies that surround it, and use the best of cutting edge science to ensure its quality, safety, and efficacy. And we need to do so not only in a timely manner, but with open and inquiring minds and a compassionate understanding for those for whom this entire scheme has been designed. Understanding that many of you have come here today to learn more about the therapeutic properties of cannabis, and may have little knowledge of the plan itself. My, prep, my, well, my presentation has been designed to lay down some solid groundwork so that you can learn the most out of the talks that follow behind me. Consider it kind of like a wide-ranging introduction to the topic of medicinal cannabis, during which I'll touch on things like botany, morphology and the history of use of the plant, and a few of the important myths and misconceptions that may be weighing on your minds. After hopefully by then lulling you into a full sense of security and comfort, I'll then discuss the more detailed aspects of phytochemistry and chemical synergy, work my way through that list that you see up there, and finish with the importance of patient-centered treatment when it comes to using this plan. With this being said, I must, be, uh, must admit to feeling a little bit like a warm-up band for the Rolling Stones uh, or Led Zeppelin when I see some of the names that are preceding me. Um, 
uh, afterwards. So these guys are leading, many of them are leading the world in medical cannabis research and its clinical use. So people like Ethan Russo, Bonnie Goldstein, Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather, Robert Clark, Christina Sanchez, just to name a few, who've made you know, such an important trip and given freely of their time for this symposium. It's based on the research and clinical experience of a lot of these speakers that we're learning more about this truly unique plant. And I look forward to sitting in the audience alongside you when I'm done and enjoying listening from them from the next couple of days. So in setting the stage for this talk, I wanted to start with a quote by the German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. All truth passes through three stages. First, it's ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. So as you listen to the wide range of topics and speakers over this weekend, I want you to ruminate on these questions and ponder two things. How does this quote apply to cannabis in our recent history? And perhaps more importantly, where do you think it's currently situated within these three stages right now? So before we get started looking at cannabis botany, we need to have a brief touch on some of the terminology so that we can give you some context. So botany is obviously the study of, the, of study of plants and their physiology, their function, and relatively new science of things like plant genetics. Morphology is a branch of botany fo focusing specifically on the form, shape, or physical characteristics of plants. So as you can see by that lovely picture up there of a cannabis inflorescence, which is made up of many little florets, this represents an example of morphology. Taxonomy, on the other hand, is a science of classification of all living things and harkens back to the great Swedish naturalist Carl Linnaeus. It's based primarily on us observing the morphology of organisms and grouping those with similar physical attributes into divisions, orders, genuses, and species. Let's face it, we humans love to categorize, organize, and pigeonhole information into bite-sized pieces. And it's the field of taxonomy that allows us to do this. For example, humans are classified as homo sapiens, from the Latin which apparently means wise person. Albeit, if you watch the nightly news or have been observing the current US presidential election campaign of late, you would be right to question if that is an entirely appropriate label for all people. Lastly, chemotaxonomy is an emerging science that allows us, with much greater detail, to categorize plants. Indeed, instead of just relying on plant morphology to properly attribute plants into their various families or divisions taxonomically, we can now analyze their chemistry to look for associations and relationships. So before we move on, I notice some of you are taking notes. Um, I just wanted to mention that I don't want to see any of you doing that because this talk will be loaded up on UIC. So you can download it and have access to the list of references uh, within this presentation that you can uh, look up, read, and research at your own time. So just sit back and relax. All right then, so let's look at some botany. The Cannabaceae family, interestingly, is a relatively small family of flowering plants encompassing only about 11 genera and about 170 different species. So cannabis comes from the same family as another useful herbal medicine, Humulus lupulus, known as hops. So in herbal medicine, hops is actually a mild sedative and hypnotic agent to assist in sleep, much like cannabis is also. So it's also, and perhaps more importantly to us many Australians, used as an agent in the manufacturing of beer. So for all of you that enjoy a good ale or lager tonight, know you're likely enjoying that refreshing taste because of a very close relative of the cannabis plant. So currently and for many years, we believe that there are largely two major species within the genus cannabis, cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. So the first name, cannabis, uh, denotes the genus name. And the second name, the specific epithet, denotes the species. These two names together are known as the binomial. So generally speaking, the species name conveys information as to an identifying characteristic about the plant, or perhaps tells us from where it comes from. Sativa means of the fields, denoting it was largely cultivated in large crops, much like we commonly call hemp today. Whereas indica, on the other hand, is letting us know that it originated from India and the regions surrounding it. More to the point, with so much interbreeding of cannabis species, and selective plant breeding programs producing hybrids and different strains, it's almost a moot point to discuss what species are useful for certain medicinal conditions. We really need to analyze the individual phytochemistry of the plant to know what it might be useful for and encourage various plant research projects 
mapping ge uh, cannabis genetics to understand this complex genus in much greater detail. As such, the taxonomic classification of cannabis is one that is constantly unfolding and has been the subject of great academic debate over the past few decades. The ability to use this chemical analysis is bringing much more information to light, with recent scholarly works uh, in this field changing the way we view the taxonomy of the family altogether, including various new subspecies, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. Common names are those that are popularly used uh, in everyday language, of course. So the problem with this, though, is that they're not very scientifically meaningful. We've created all of these different names for various strains of cannabis, but at the end of the day, whether it's a low THC producing hemp rich plant, rich in fiber or seeds, or a resin rich drug variety, they're all still species of cannabis. And it doesn't serve the scientific community to be using common names. Interestingly, and to prove this point, marijuana was originally a Mexican term for cheap tobacco and had little to do with cannabis at all. Lastly, we need to focus on the different parts of the plant of industrial and medicinal use, but I'll cover this in more detail as we move through the next few slides and highlight some of the different morphological characteristics of the cannabis genus. So this is a map of the present day ranges of the cannabis gene pool worldwide. Here you notice the proposed new subspecies down the bottom here within the cannabis genus, breaking it down into narrow and broadleaf uh, varieties that are utilized primarily as either drug types or for food, fiber, and seed production. Worthy of note here is that in zones that are capable of supporting plant life on that map, you will see that cannabis is present. Second is that cannabis is seen on every major inhabited continent because our ancestors took it with them wherever they went, such was its value and need. They needed it as a staple and revered it for its versatility, therapeutic effectiveness and hardiness. It's a very robust plant resilient to many different pests and conditions. I mean, come on, they don't call it weed for nothing, okay? Now let's have a look at some of the different morphological characteristics of the cannabis genus so that we can see what it looks like. So note that both of these leaves look quite similar, of course. They both share the classic tapered acuminate apex that you see up the top, compound leaf structure and a serrated leaf margin, but the length, width and chemical characteristics are markedly different in these two plants. Whether broad or narrow leaf species or subspecies, both share medicinal and, and industrial applications. Did you know that the leaves are generally regarded as a waste product in cannabis cultivation? However, anecdotal reports of patients juicing them and obtaining therapeutic benefit from this because of the higher concentration of THCA has been observed and is certainly worthy of further scientific investigation. Here on the left, you see a photo of a male cannabis plant. The stamens are comprised of a filament upon which the anther sits and produces the pollen. As you can see in figure six, can, uh, the male cannabis plant does produce quite a large amount of pollen, and this can travel great distances on the wind. And for this reason, it's generally kept isolated from the female plants, except if breeding is desired. If a female plant gets pollinated, it will produce large amounts of seeds, which detract from its ability to produce larger amounts of phytochemicals and may negatively impact medicinal potency. As such, the standard for producing medicinal strains of cannabis is to ensure that only unfertilized female plants, commonly known as sensomia, is cultivated and generally cuttings or clones are taken from these unfertilized mother plants so that they have the identical genetic makeup and assist in maintaining consistent quality of the phytochemicals required. You will notice how it looks like there's a hazy whitish coating on the female plant on the right. This is not a mold or fungus, but actually another morphological characteristic of the plant known as trichomes. On this slide, you can see two female cannabis plants. Come on, there we go. So on the left, you can see the feathery looking female reproductive part known as the stigma. This is the structure that the male pollen lands on and for fertilization to occur. You can also see the glandular trichomes, which have been magnified on the right. This is where many of the phytochemicals of medicinal interest are stored within the cannabis plant, mainly the cannabinoids and the terpenes. Hashish, that some of you might have heard of, is a resinous extract of just these glandular trichomes and represents a very strong end product that's been used in ritual, ceremony, and medicine by humans for thousands of years. 
as it is essentially purified cannabinoids and terpenes, much less is required to be used as a medicine in comparison to just crude dried plant material. In figure 10 here, you see a finished trimmed inflorescence, commonly referred, of course, to as a bud, covered in those crystalline glandular trichomes. So this specific strain there on the left is known as Bubba Kush, as it pays homage to its ancestry, being an indica-dominant drug variety from the Hindu Kush region of Afghanistan, and famous for being a rich resin producing and high, high in THC. Figure 11, right next to it, is another rich resin strain known as Afghani Kush, another uh, variety known for sedation and pain relief. Now here's something quite unique about cannabis that you might not know. Both cannabis sativa and cannabis indica are known to be affected by what's known as photoperiodism, which is defined as the developmental response or physiological action or reaction of a plant to the relative length of the daylight cycle. Most normal flowering plants go into uh, flower in warmer spring and summer months, but not cannabis. During spring and summer months, when sunlight exposure is anywhere between 15 to 18 hours, depending of course on your geographical location, these plants undertake vegetative growth. During this phase, they maximize the growth of their leaves to produce carbohydrates through the process of photosynthesis, which I'm sure you all remember from year nine biology class. So the process provides the fuel to increase the growth and vitality of the plant. On this slide, you can see a, a similar vegetative growth pattern, but this time with much younger plants and under indoor lighting conditions. So as the sunlight wanes as it heads into autumn and winter, dropping down to about 10 to 12 hours a day, this starts the process of flowering, which is the main morphological structure of interest medicinally. So this is why cannabis is suited to both outdoor growing and indoor growing, as it's a simple matter of light exposure to change the plant from this vegetative to flowering stage. Now, whilst my talk is mainly focusing on the medicinal uses and chemistry of cannabis, it is worthy of note that cannabis has, been has a, an incredibly long history of use as both a food and fiber. It's thought that many ancient civilizations from the Asian and European regions have cultivated species of cannabis mainly for these reasons, with some academics believing this history of use to date back over 10,000 years. The seeds of cannabis produce a highly nutritious oil rich in omega-3 and omega-6 essential fatty acids. The oil can also be converted into a form of biodiesel to fuel cars and can even be used in manufacture of plastics. The seeds also a great source for dietary protein for vegans and vegetarians. The soft but highly durable fiber from the stalk of cannabis obtained from particularly the narrow leaf, uh, narrow leaf varieties such as cannabis sativa are commonly known as hemp. So this fiber has been used in ropes, paper, clothing for thousands of years. And more recently, hemp's been used to manufacture a, uh, affordable and thermally efficient housing in the form of hempcrete, once again highlighting the versatility of this plant. What you start to understand is that after looking at these industrial and food applications and taking into account the medicinal crops that could also be produced, cannabis could be a, a wide-ranging and economically viable export crop potentially for our Aussie farmers. So if you want to learn a little bit more about the many virtues of the uh, non-medicinal aspects of the cannabis plant, make sure and check out the diverse range of stalls just out there to your left. As we were just speaking of history of use, let's explore this topic briefly as well. So many ethnobotanists and academics believe that cannabis has been used throughout many regions of the world for over 10 millennia. However, obtaining hard proof of this is difficult to exactly quantify due to its cultivation and consumption predating the appearance of writing and human evolution. Written records exist, but they only are found in certain cultures and at a much later date. So cannabis is believed to have originated in the Central Asian region, with nomadic peoples first coming across it when they entered its home range. Interestingly, in geographical locations where cannabis was cultivated for fiber, it was not used as a psychotropic or medicinal agent, suggesting that different species or subspecies dispersal was at a very early time in our evolution. This, the specific knowledge and growth of more broadleaf drug varieties seem to have originated in the Himalayan region, particularly near modern-day Afghanistan, whereby it was disseminated to India, China, Asia Minor, and North Africa, and was likely a very valuable trade commodity. Seeds would have also been highly valued and, and, and allowed for the spread of this plant across the globe. And if you want to learn more about the very early history of use of cannabis, I'd highly recommend the book Cannabis Evolution and Ethnobotany by Clark 
and Merlin. So according to solid archaeological evidence, cannabis has been in, in China since the Neolithic period around 4000 BC. It was first written of by the Emperor Shen Nung in his Compendium of Medicinal Herbs around 2700 BC. And similar evidence has been found in the written histories of India. Because of the established trade routes throughout Asia and the Middle East, this knowledge soon spread to the Mediterranean, with the famous Greek physician Pedanius Dios Dorides also singing the praises of cannabis in his magnum opus Demeteria Medica, which interestingly was used to teach medicine and physicians for the better part of 1400 years. So in more recent history, cannabis was brought to the UK from India by British physician O'Shaughnessy in around 1839, after he observed its use as an effective appetite stimulant, anti-emetic, muscle relaxant, anti-convulsant, and analgesic, with even Queen Victoria being dispensed this plant for painful periods. I mean, talk about the royal seal of approval, yeah? So its use continued spreading, and by 1854, it was included in the United States dispensary and was sold freely in the majority of Western countries, still being available in most of them for more than 100 years after that time. Unfortunately, it was around 1937 that US authorities uh, condemned the use of cannabis after the lifting of alcohol prohibition, and against the advice of the American Medical Association at the time, passed the Marijuana Tax Act, which effectively made it illegal. It was officially removed from the United States Pharmacopoeia in 1942, and other Western countries, such as Great Britain and most of Europe, banned cannabis by adopting the United Nations Convention on Psychotropic Agents, effectively categorizing cannabis in the same class as heroin. So there you have it, over 10,000 years of safe, effective, and valued use by our ancestors, and when the signing of a piece of paper, this plant disappeared from current use. So I'm sure you can agree with me then that at least the use of medicinal cannabis is not so much a new discovery, we're simply seeking to reinstate this incredibly diverse plant to her rightful place. So with that being said, let's look at some of the common questions that I'm sure that many of you have pondered about the potential dangers of cannabis and its safety. So many of the questions that you see listed up here are some that I get asked most often by people on the topic of medicinal cannabis and are of course valid concerns. The reality is that in many instances there is conflicting evidence available on many of these topics. So I've done my best to present a balanced appraisal of this in the slides that follow. So the intelligence quotient or IQ is based on standardized testing to assess human intelligence of which of course several tests exist. It's long been touted that cannabis can actually reduce human IQ because it kills brain cells, which are known as neurons. Whilst consumption of certain varieties of cannabis may indeed cause a decreased function in short-term memory, these changes are not considered permanent and resolve with cessation. So as a general rule of thumb, guys, you might want to stay clear of using cannabis before sitting any formal exams or if you're a contestant on who wants to be a millionaire. But recently, a review of two longitudinal twin studies conducted by Jackson and colleagues published earlier this year found that cannabis using twins failed to show significantly greater IQ decline relative to their abstinent siblings, suggesting that observed declines in IQ are more attributable to familial or other factors. More interestingly is that compounds within cannabis have actually been found to be neuroprotective. In vitro test tube and animal studies are demonstrating that certain cannabinoids in cannabis, such as CBD, may reduce damage to the brain caused by lack of blood flow or oxygen supply, and also assist in preventing the neurological degeneration seen in conditions such as multiple sclerosis and Alzheimer's disease. Now, while small research certainly needs to be conducted in human trials, the preliminary results are certainly encouraging. So I get asked this one probably most of all, uh, does all cannabis get you high? And the long and the short of it is that no, it doesn't. So compounds such as tetrahydrocannabinol are generally attributed with the psychoactive effect of making the user feel high or stoned. Narrow leaf drug varieties rich in CBD and lower in THC are incredibly useful medicines that do not cause this feeling, which is why many people prefer to use the non-psychoactive strains during the day to assist in managing their condition so as not to feel too affected, allowing them to still hold down jobs and be productive, and then they can save the stronger THC-rich strains for, for nighttime use to help them sleep or deal with pain. This level of individualization in specific strains of cannabis is one of the greatest strengths of this as a medicine. 
Do, so does this mean that THC is a potentially negative constituent, I hear you ask? And the answer is certainly not. THC is the main constituent involved in pain relieving, sedative, muscle relax and activities within cannabis. And in the interest of fairness and comparing apples with apples, let's not forget that pharmaceutical drugs such as the opiate class, including me medicines like morphine, pethidine, codeine, or benzo benzodiazepine drugs such as Valium, uh, both classes used in analgesia and muscle relaxation don't exactly leave you feeling normal either. Okay, so what about the topic of cannabis causing dependence or being highly addictive? So this is obviously an important topic and one that many patients and their carers, medical professionals and politicians may be concerned about. After reviewing sample sizes used in various studies, I found this study conducted by Anthony Warner and Kessler in 94, which surveyed over 8,000 people in the USA between the ages of 15 and 54, and was designed to assess patterns of dependence. Of particular interest here is that cannabis can indeed cause dependency. However, let's look at the statistics a little close. 24% of the study respondents with a history of dependence, or one in four reported being dependent to tobacco, whilst 14%, or one in seven, uh, reported uh, dependence to alcohol as classified by the American Psychiatric Association's definition in the DSM. So worthy of note here is that after seeing these previous statistics that only 4% reported dependence to cannabis, six times less that than that of uh, tobacco. Now let's remember that both tobacco and alcohol are legally obtainable and socially acceptable and are not illicit substances. So many other facets also need to be considered here, such as individual variability of the patient and why the cannabis is being used. For example, if someone's suffering from chronic intractable pain that is non-responsive to pharmaceutical medication, I think it's reasonable to assume that the patient might get dependent to this plant for pain relieving activity on a daily basis. So this now leads us to the next question. Does cannabis cause people to go on to use harder drugs? And the evidence here is actually quite compelling. So the idea of cannabis being a gateway drug is not new. And not surprisingly, there's a great deal of conflicting evidence in the scientific literature. A gateway drug is defined as one that apparently can lead to the use of harder, more addictive or dangerous drugs such as heroin or methamphetamines as examples. Firstly, we need to consider that as cannabis is obtained from the black market due to its current illegality, it stands to reason that other illicit drugs of a harder nature are also obtained from similar sources. This simple association is potentially difficult to remove in studies as a confounding variable. In California, a state that's legalized medical cannabis dispensaries, patients can access just medicinal cannabis with a card from their authorized provider. A study conducted in California in 2008 that you see here was on 350 registered medicinal cannabis users and found that cannabis may actually serve as an exit drug and not a gateway drug. Let's have a look at some of the figures. So 40% of the respondents reported using cannabis as a substitute for alcohol, which we already know has a higher dependency rate. 26% used it as a substitute for other illicit drugs, and 66% used it as a substitution for prescription medication. Now further findings also suggested that 65% of patients use medicinal cannabis due to the propensity for less side effects, 34% due to the less withdrawal effects, and 57% felt that it provided better symptom management for their specific medical conditions. Now I need to be clear here and state that stopping certain pharmaceutical medications without close communication and monitoring by a qualified medical practitioner is not a wise nor responsible thing. So open and frank communication is always best to keep your clinician informed and you safe. Now in the interest of balance, this was only a small study, but it does propose a counter argument against the traditional viewpoint. And whilst on this topic, new evidence has been shown that medicinal cannabis use is associated with a decrease in pharmaceutical opioid deaths. The CDC in the USA posted that in 2010, over 16,000 people died from pharmaceutical opioid analgesics, which equates to roughly 45 people per day, and that opioid overdoses have quadrupled from the year 2000 to 2014. Almost two million, in 2014, sorry, almost two million Americans abused or were dependent on prescription opioids, and from the period 1999 to 2014, more than 165,000 of them have died from overdoses related to prescription opioid medications. Lastly, every day, 1,000 people are treated in US emergency rooms nationwide for misusing these prescriptive, pre prescriptive drugs. 
Now, Barkhuber and colleagues published a paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association this year, which was clearly demonstrating that state medicinal cannabis laws in the USA are associated with a statistically significant lower state level opioid overdose mortality rate, which supports the findings presented in the Ryman statistics above, and also supports the cannabis may well be an exit drug in certain circumstances. Now, what about this question? Can cannabis cause psychosis or schizophrenia? Psychosis can be both a symptom by itself or a feature of mental illness. It's characterized by being unable to distinguish what is real or losing contact with reality. And interestingly, according to the SANE Australia website, most people recover from such episodes. The causes of psychosis are not fully understood, but involve a complex interplay of individual genetics, phys uh, physical, environmental, and psychological factors. So there's been a large amount of articles proposing that cannabis can indeed cause psychosis and schizophrenia. However, in a review article published this year by Sir and Hart, it was proposed that the evidence reviewed from previous studies suggests that cannabis does not in itself cause a psychotic disorder. Rather, the evidence led the researchers to conclude that both early use and heavy use of cannabis are more likely in individuals with a vulnerability to psychosis. So more research obviously is needed to be conducted in this area to fully understand the relationship. And we must also consider the quality or strain of the cannabis that was being used, if it was adulterated with other illicit substances and the dose that was being taken as predisposing variables. So this is an interesting topic. As anyone that studied the human body and toxicology will tell you that many mundane things can actually be characterized as harmful. Even drinking uh, too much water can kill you. So after looking at the findings for cannabis causing psychosis, I think we have to accept that it could be, of course, be harmful, given the right circumstances and in certain individuals, and perhaps more likely that it can cause changes in perception that if given the right environment, such as operating heavy machinery, may cause an increased chance of harm to self or harm to others. So, but let us, um, so this being said, it's difficult to find accurate statistics about actual deaths caused by cannabis alone in Australian data sets. A report issued by the Vic Road Safety Department estimated roughly that cannabis intoxication alone was responsible for about 4.3% uh, of driver fatalities. So it's obvious that responsible use is an important topic in this discussion. So data obtained from uh, Australian data sets is hard to find. Uh, because generally these data sets include multiple drugs that may have contributed to harm, not, you know, such as alcohol or other illicit drugs, not just the cannabis. So as these are not separated out, we don't get a completely accurate picture of the relative risk, but can still see that based on these changes and perceived changes to mental uh, perception, we have to assume that risk of harm exists. But let's now bring some statistics for comparative purposes that we do know quite well. Data obtained from the Australian government's quit line suggests that 50 Australians die every day from tobacco-related disease. That's one every 28 minutes. In 1998 alone, over 19,000 deaths were attributed to tobacco use, whilst in 1995, 3.2 million Australians were identified at being of risk of chronic health conditions from uh, tobacco smoking. At the time, this equated to a quarter of, almost a quarter of the adult population. So the impact not only on individual health, but as a burden to the healthcare system cannot be overlooked. And the statistics guys for alcohol aren't that rosy either. In 2010, there were 5,500 deaths attributable to alcohol, with an additional 157,000 hospitalizations in that same year. So can cannabis cause potential harm? The answer, of course, is yes. But when comparing currently available statistics on cannabis-related harm to those of the legal and socially acceptable alcohol and tobacco, well, guys, in my opinion, it's kind of like comparing a fart to a cyclone, OK? So now that we've... So now that we've addressed some of these important questions, let's get back on track by looking at an incredibly important neuromodulatory uh, system in the body that we would know actually nothing about unless it was for cannabis. So before we get started looking into the phytochemistry of the plant, it's important that we quickly review the system within the body with which these chemicals within cannabis interact. So I'm only going to touch on this lightly as you have a world leading expert in this field coming after me, Dr. Ethan Russo and he'll be able to go into this in the intricacies of this very fascinating system in much greater detail than I. So did you know that most medical curri curriculums currently in university do not teach about this system, the endocannabinoid system? 
So I feel that very soon this is going to be changing. So the endocannabinoid system, in short, is all about homeostasis. This is a term used to describe how the body can regulate variables so that conditions remain relatively constant and stable. It's all about balance. So we could look at disease as being a shift away from homeostasis, whereby the body can no longer uh, maintain balance and, as such, start suffering from symptoms and signs that manifest as dis-ease. So due to the distribution of the endocannabinoid system throughout the, ba uh, the brain, spinal cord, and other organs and tissues, it plays a significant role in the regulating a broad list of physiological processes, including the regulation of stress and emotions, at digestion, pain, cardiovascular and immune function, neurological development, synaptic plasticity and learning, memory, bodily movement, metabolism and energy expenditure, inflammation, appetite, sleep-wake cycles, and even temperature regulation. So fundamentally, the ECS is comprised of three major components. The ca cannabinoid receptors, distributed throughout the various organs and tissues, known as CB1 and CB2 receptors. The endogenous chemicals, which we call ligands, that actually our own bodies produce, that then bind with these receptors. And lastly, the enzymes, which are involved in the synthesis and degradation of these ligands. So it's these same receptors and others within the body that the phytocannabinoids, that is the cannabinoids derived from the cannabis plant, that they also interact with. So as such, any slight difference that we sh show in the expression of these components, what we call inter-individual variability, or genetic polymorphic uh, modifications, can potentially alter the physiology of the entire endocannabinoid system, and therefore affect how cannabis might interact with all of us as individuals. This highlights the complexity of cannabis pharmacotherapy in clinical application. In 2015, I had the distinct pleasure of speaking on a radio program in Mendocino County in California with Dr. Jeffrey Hergenrather, a noted cannabis physician with decades of practice under his belt. And one thing that he made quite clear, and one that I wholeheartedly agree with, is that cannabis may not be the panacea or cure-all that everyone thinks it is, and has the potential to affect everyone differently. We, which should not make that much uh, or be too much of a surprise for you considering that pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol and even foods affect all of us differently depending on our individual genetic and physiological makeup. I mean, let's be honest, we all know that one person that's up dancing on tables after two glasses of shardy and one that's up cleaning the house until 2am because they had a coffee after dinner. So currently there's two main endocannabinoids that we've uh, emerged in the research as prevalent regulators of synaptic function and this is an andamide and 2AG. Now for any of you runners out there in the audience, here's an interesting tidbit of information. Did you know that for decades scientists have attributed the feeling of runner's high with endorphins, and these elevate mood, reduce anxiety, and reduce pain perception? Interestingly, a research paper by Fuss and colleagues in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year demonstrated in an animal model that an andamide is highly elevated in running and is likely also contributing to this effect. So if proven true in humans, the term high takes on whole new meaning. So def definitions, or by definition, phytochemistry is the study and analysis of the many different chemicals that exist within plants. So on this amazing planet, there's approximately 240,000 different species of flowering plants. And it's estimated that we've only actually looked at about 10,000 earnestly for medicinal virtue. I'll just let that number sink in for you for a little while as I guide you through this part of the talk. Now that we've touched on the endocannabinoid system, let's take a look at the finer chemicals within cannabis that can interact with these endocannabinoid receptors, and not only cannabinoids, but other pharmacological classes uh, that can contribute therapeutically via other mechanisms of action. So you've all probably heard of the psychoactive cannabinoid Delta-9-THC, or tetrahydrocannabinol, and also maybe cannab uh, cannabidiol, CBD, which is gaining a great deal of media attention of late because of its anticonvulsant activity in assisting with epilepsy management but there are numerous other cannabinoids and other phytochemical classes within the plant that are also of clinical interest. All right, so let me take you through this diagram. It was so worth it me putting up there. I just really enjoyed looking at the looks on your faces, so please indulge me there. Um, so now things, I must admit, are going to get a little bit more technical, but I promise I'm going to make this as pain-free as possible. So kind of think of it like pulling off a Band-Aid. Unfortunately, it's going to be slowly done over about nine slides in ten minutes, but we'll, we'll get there. So let's move on to something that looks a little bit less like the love child of a chemistry textbook and a street map of Sydney. 
How about that? I think that's much more manageable. Now, cannabinoids are a class of what we call terpenophenolic compounds that occur in the cannabis plant. So you can see why they're called terpenophenolic on this diagram. So up there in the right-hand corner is a levitolic acid, which represents the phenolic moiety, and on the left is geronyl pyrophosphate, represents the terpene moiety. Now, these come together to form cannabigerolic acid, which is the precursor for all other major cannabinoid acids. Now, in, its, in this acid form, which is largely carboxylated, okay, so meaning that they have carbon dioxide molecules attached to them, which I've highlighted in blue for you. So if you go skipping through a cannabis plantation, uh, uh, picking inflorescences and eating them, the cannabinoids exist in this acid form and you're not going to get high off it, okay, because the chemistry will not bind to the receptors. But you may certainly obtain some other therapeutic benefit. So far, there have been over 60 different cannabinoids classified, but this is largely dependent on the strain and species of cannabis being tested, as they all demonstrate unique cannabinoid profiles, which are subject to change based on variables such as temperature, sunlight exposure, soil pH, and elevation. So in the fresh plant, if in these uh, acid forms that exist, not their end products, which is what we predominantly want to use as medicines, such as THC and CBD. So once we dry and cure the plant material or expose it to heat, such as with smoking, vaping, or baking edible dosage forms, these carboxyl groups highlighted in blue vibrate at a very, very high frequency, and they actually snap off. So this releases carbon dioxide and allows for the new decarboxylated product that is formed to interact with various cannabinoid receptors and other receptor types. So think of it kind of like a lock and key. As long as the carboxyl group is attached, the key cannot quite fit. But once removed, this is rectified. Here we see how this decarboxylation process changes the non-psychoactive tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, or THCA, into the uh, psychoactive delta-9 THC. But this same process exists for other plant-like acids like cannabidiolic acid being converted into CBD. So it's not without good reason, of course, that THC and CBD are perhaps the best known of the phytocannabinoids. Not only were they some of the first cannabinoids to be elucidated chemically, but they have also had the lion's share of research conducted on them. So here we see a small snapshot of some of the actions attributed uh, to them coming from in vitro, in vivo, and human clinical studies. Now THC binds with relatively high affinity to both the CB1 and CB2 receptors in the central nervous system very similar to that of our own endogenous ma endogenously manufactured anandamide. So this constituent is associated with the feeling of psychoactivity, and if given in high isolated doses, can cause dysphoria and potential paranoia and anxiety in certain individuals. Pharmacologically, THC is a well-described analgesic in the management of pain related to cancer, muscle spasm, migraine, phantom limb pain, spinal cord injury, damaged nerves, and has even been used post -surgery, uh, for post-surgery pain. It's also shown benefit in assisting with the muscle spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis, and perhaps is best known as an appetite-promoting agent for cancer and AIDS patients, and also in reducing the nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Less well known is evidence supporting its use for lowering intraocular pressure in eye condition known as glaucoma, and for reducing symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease. Tomorrow at noon, Dr. Christina Sanchez will speak about the therapeutic potential of medicinal cannabis in cancer for which THC is believed to hold to be a very important constituent contributing significantly to this activity. CBD, on the other hand, is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid and actually opposes the dysphoric effects of THC, which is why it is of benefit to have the two constituents present in varying amounts depending on the therapeutic condition that's being treated. Unlike THC, CBD has very low binding affinity for CB1 and CB2 receptors, but rather works via different mechanisms of action, such as being an agonist for serotonin, which may explain why it exhibits such good antidepressant and anxiolytic activity. Due to CBD's antioxidant, anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective actions, it holds great interest in the treatment of seizures, epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, multiple sclerosis, and also Alzheimer's. As I'm sure you've noticed, the fact that some of these pharmacological actions are highlighted in blue is showing how these actions are shared between these two constituents, albeit in many cases this will be by different mechanisms of action or by interacting with different receptors. I want you to tuck this away in your memory for a little bit and I'll pull on that soon. But this is just two cannabinoids out of the 60 that have been characterized within this plant. But what about the other cannabinoids I hear you say? So, 
These are, uh, these are also of, of great uh, value in their own right, and we need to encourage research into these to learn more about their complex interrelationships, not only within the plant, and also their therapeutic potential for different conditions. So worthy of note here is uh, some of the minor cannabinoids, such as Delta-9 THC, which exhibits less psychoactivity than Delta-9, but still expresses many of the same useful therapeutic activities of its stronger cousin. Tetrahydrocannabivarin, or THCV, exhibits anticonvulsant activity similar to CBD, and can cannabidivarin is also of interest in improving glucose tolerance in type 2 diabetes, which is currently, obviously, a, cur a, a major public health problem in developed countries around the world. Whereas can cannabinol and cannabigerol share the ability to decrease proliferation of keratinocytes and therefore show some great therapeutic promise in the skin condition known as psoriasis. So whilst a large amount of these actions are of course demonstrated only in animal or in vitro models, it really does highlight how much more there is to this plant from a research perspective and that it's not just about THC and CBD. So this was eight of the 60 cannabinoids that we briefly looked at. Let's now have a look at a completely different pharmacological class of compounds known as the terpenes. So as I'm sure you remember, the terpenes are found and held within the same glandular trichomes of the cannabis plant that the cannabinoids are. So it's this phytochemical class that largely contributes to the unique tastes and smells associated with the different cannabis strains. You can think of these as like the essential oils that the cannabis plant produces. And they're not unique to the cannabis plant, but are commonly, ubiquitously, and abundantly distributed throughout many different plant families and species. So how many of you like the smell of lemons? So this is lemonine, and it's responsible for the smell of many citrus species. So what you might not know about this little terpene is that it packs quite a therapeutic punch uh, by not only having strong anxiolytic and even antidepressant activities, but also showing evidence for use in gastroesophageal reflux disease and has moderate antibacterial activity and has also been shown to produce cell death in breast cancer cells. Now these antioxidant and anxiolytic activities highlighted in blue are also shared with CBD, but occur via a different mechanism. So having multiple phytochemicals within a plant that exhibit simil similar pharmacological activity increases the therapeutic potential of the medicine and is something that uh, has been used long term in herbal medicine and known as phytochemical synergy. Then we have beta myrcene. So this monoterpene exhibits muscle relaxant, sedative, anti-inflammatory and analgesic actions, which as you know are also both shared by CBD and THC. So do many of you like the clean scent of pine needles? Okay. If so, then you can thank alpha-pinene for that. So this monoterpene exhibits anti-inflammatory, bronchodilatory activities, which as you guessed it, is also shared by the two major cannabinoids. So many other terpenes exist, with over 200 being uh, identified in cannabis alone. Another worthy of note, but not described above, uh, is the sedative and soothing qualities of linalool, which is also seen in lavender. So this calming terpene is useful in anxiety and has also been found in a 1995 study to have anticonvulsant activity. So did you know that currently in the USA, uh, at the moment, the unique terpene profiles exhibited by different cannabis strains are incredibly popular with medical users, not only because they make the medicine taste and smell quite unique, but because they feel these strains offer a wider range of therapeutic effect. So as you can see, there exists a great deal of crossover when it comes to just these two phytochemical classes. That being said, over 700 different phytochemicals have been characterized across various cannabis strains. So the diversity of pharmacological actions and potential benefit for many different health problems is easy to see. So here are just a handful of the other phytochemical classes that come from this plant. Worthy of note are the flavonoids which exhibit widespread anti-inflammatory activity. So I'm not gonna bore you anymore with too much detail because I think I've expressed just how complex and incredible this plant really is. You can literally grow a specific plant or strain that expresses a certain phytochemical profile and then manufacture medicines that will harness the broad range of chemistry available for that specific strain. So this idea that uh, different plants or their constituents can interact with each other is not a new idea. Ancient traditional systems of medicine such as Ayurveda from India and traditional Chinese medicine would combine certain herbs together to increase therapeutic effect or decrease certain side effects. So this concept known as synergy is still employed by herbal medicine practitioners and naturopaths today. What's interesting, however, is that we now have scientific proof of the validity of this mechanism. And not surprisingly, much of this work has been done based around cannabis. 
pioneering researchers in the field of cannabis, Professor Ben Shabbat and later Dr. Raphael Meshulam, termed this type of interactive synergy the entourage effect. Dr. Ethan Russo, who will be speaking later, has also published on this topic, talking ab about the potential synergy between cannabinoids and the terpene class in his landmark paper that you see up there, Taming THC. So the concept of herbal synergy, or this entourage effect, is based on the premise that phytochemicals interact in a dynamic and meaningful way to provide a stronger or more modified effect when used in combination. So the mechanisms by which this could occur are many and variable, with Wagner and Ulrich Mazanek proposing that the following potential synergistic mechanisms. So for multi-target effects, we've already touched on this previously, Consider the way the anti-inflammatory actions of CBD, THC, and certain terpenes and flavonoids have a stronger effect being used in combination, yet all doing so by slightly different mechanisms of action or receptors within the body. Simply put, pharmacokinetics is defined as what the body does to the drug after it enters the body. So this process is largely controlled by the liver and depends on the type of dosage form that's being used, such as oral ingestion or intravenous administration, both of which would be absorbed, metabolized, and excreted by the person in different ways. Now, pharmacokinetic effects are incredibly important and include how and where a substance is absorbed, how it's distributed throughout the body via blood, tissues, and fluid, and how, it, how it's broken down and metabolized by the liver, and lastly, how it's excreted out of the body. Interestingly, we all as individuals execute these four functions slightly differently depending on our genetics and physiological makeup. So it also includes the substances that may improve bioavailability and assimilation. So this is a really interesting synergistic mechanism, as depending on the constituents involved, we may witness increased absorption of various cannabinoids if they're used in combination. For example, certain terpenes have been shown to increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier, potentially causing a faster onset of action, which could be very useful in pain management. So this may actually mean that less medicine is needed by increasing the absorption and availability of it within the body. Lastly, the modulation of adverse effects is also an important mechanism of synergy. And I've already discussed one earlier, how CBD can oppose, oppose the dysphoric effects of THC in isolation. So this naturally brings us to a discussion about single active medicines and full spectrum medicines, or full, uh, single and uh, full, act, uh, full spectrum extracts. So now let me be clear by saying that single active cannabis-based medicines work for many people. Medicines such as Epidiolex, a purified single active of plant-derived CBD, is being used uh, and trialed for epilepsy and children with Dravet syndrome. As another example, Nabilone, which is a synthetic laboratory-made cannabinoid medicine mimicking the structure of THC, has been used as an antiemetic and analgesic for neuropathic pain. Problem is, it's also associated with a broad range of adverse effects such as ataxia, headache, nausea, dizziness, and sleep disturbance. Marinol, also known as Dranabinol, is another synthetic THC derivative used for increasing appetite and AIDS patients and reducing the nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy, but also has an adverse effect profile associated with it, potentially causing seizures. A story shared by many patients I've spoken to over the years in my travels overseas in the US is that they preferred full spectrum extracts due to better therapeutic effect and less side effects. At the very least, patients should have access to both single and full spectrum extracts as it should be about what gets results for the individual. So the term whole plant extract is often used interchangeably with full spectrum. The term is, this term I find a little confusing because it implies that the whole of the plant is actually used in the manufacturing process, that is, the roots and all of the above ground parts, which we know is simply not true. This is why I prefer the term full spectrum extract as it's denoting that a full spectrum of active constituents from a plant-based product is being utilized not just as a single active. So, and as we've seen already, this entourage effect has many potential benefits. So whilst active, uh, single actives can be of benefit, let me paint a bit of a picture for you as I walk you through this analogy, which after your brief introduction into phytochemistry today should make sense. So single CBD or THC actives uh, can be thought of as a gladiator walking out into the Colosseum with a large sword, but clad only in a loincloth. The sword, of course, is the single active that is at a standardized dose. Full spectrum extracts would be the heavily armed and fully armored counterpart that has more phytochemistry and the entourage effect at its disposal. I think you get the point. This leads us now to talk about dosage forms. 
And as cannabinoids and other pharmacologically active phytochemicals within uh, the, the plant, such as the terpene class, are highly lipophilic, meaning that they're fat soluble, the dosage form of how the cannabis is administered is also very cl clinically relevant for the individual patient and condition being treated. This may determine the difference between treatment failure and amelioration of symptoms, and also other factors such as duration of effect, potency, and speed of onset. For example, orally ingested THC-rich dosage forms will undergo biotransformation in the liver to a slightly stronger form, but this will take 30 to 60 minutes to take effect. So this will provide a longer duration of activity, which is great, whereas smoking or vaping a similar strain will provide much quicker onset of action, but a shorter duration of effect. What's great about this um, is that multiple dosage forms could be used, utilized by individual patients based on the disease or condition that they have and its symptom expression, leaving the ability to individualize treatment and titrate dose accurately for the individual. The correct dosage form is an integral component of ensuring effective medicinal cannabis strategy and yet another variable that clinicians and patients need to navigate together. However, it, doesn't need, it does need to be mentioned that not all of these that are listed that you see have been well studied and not all of large amounts of clinical evidence, which leads to our next topic. Whilst I simply do not have the time here to go into a comprehensive amount of detail about scientific levels of, of evidence, I do want to talk about the importance of different kinds of evidence in being able to assess efficacy of treatments and collecting meaningful data, particularly when it comes to medicinal cannabis. Now, there's a wide range of different types of scientific studies, epidemiological studies, non-randomized, uh, qualitative studies, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, retrospective and cohort studies, and lastly, case studies. All of them are useful for collecting data, but they have and exhibit different levels of robustness. So speaking of which, if you're interested in contributing to research currently being conducted, check out the Australian Medicinal Cannabis Observatory survey at that link below that Lucy was talking about previously. Data uh, that's obtained from this will help researchers here in Australia understand how cannabis is currently being used for medicinal purposes. Now the three that I want to touch on quickly here um, are listed. So the randomized uh, controlled trial, what we call the RCT, is considered by many to be the gold standard on clinical study testing. And there are currently being set up for uh, testing various cannabis treatments for different disorders in Australia right now. And I think it's a fantastic that Australia is actually getting behind cannabis research and contributing to the evidence pool in the medicinal cannabis field internationally. RCTs are used to test the effectiveness of treatments by reducing selection bias by using randomization and using two groups, one that receives the treatment and the other that does not. And at the end of the study, the statistics are compared. These statistics are then uh, either of large or small p-value, which determines the significance or meaning of those results. Then you have what many consider the top level of evidence, which is a systematic review. As this is assessing results over many RCTs, it's critically analyzing available data using transparent procedures and reporting on these results, assisting in compiling a critical evidence base that shapes the way drugs or interventions are used in practice. Now, with many thousands of research papers having already been conducted on cannabis in the literature, it would be wise, I believe, for the federal government to commission an independent systematic review on cannabis use, consisting of experts across many fields to highlight what areas require more research and those that do not, therefore saving valuable time and money and not replicating studies where evidence currently exists and therefore speeding the access and therefore speeding the access of medicinal cannabis across a wide range of diseases or conditions sooner. Whilst the RCT and systematic review design are incredibly robust, it's not without flaws. RCTs are generally quite time consuming, often taking years to complete and very expensive to conduct, often costing millions of dollars. There's also the problem with conflicts of interest, who is funding the research and the potential for manipulation of statistical data. This has become highlighted in recent years with several editors of prestigious peer-reviewed journals and respected academics suggesting that it's simply no longer possible to believe all of the clinical research that is published. So hopefully with more rigor and transparency, this will stop from continuing in the future. Lastly, RCTs are also concerned a little bit more with statistical significance and less on clinical significance. That is the impact on the individual patient. And with this, I can segue into what is known as the N of 1 trial, with which many believe to be the future of patient-centered medicine. 
So unfortunately, the N of 1 study has not been given a great deal of attention in current research models. But if designed well, they can still gain large amounts of meaningful data. With everyone or everything that you've looked at so far today, I'm sure that's easy to see how a one-size-fits-all approach is not going to do patients nor cannabis as a medicine any justice. We can certainly make standardized doses of certain constituents which will assist some people, but it will not assist all of us. As, as such, we try to standardize testing, or as much as we try to standardize testing to apply to the human organism, one fact remains unchanged, and that is that we're all different. Take a look around the room for a minute. Just as we do not look the same, so too do we all function and express our anatomy and physiology with slight differences. Sure, we have the same organs, tissues, and bones, but the way that they function at a cellular, tissue, and organ level can be different from person to person. Throw this into the mix then with different phytochemical spectrums, dosage forms, and dosage of cannabis, and it's at least clear to me that the N of 1 study and medicinal cannabis seems to be a match made in heaven putting the patient first and foremost and allowing for an individualization of treatment that can be optimized based on changes in recorded outcome measures. So this brings us to a bit of a mantra that we use at uh, UIC. And hopefully after listening to my talk today, you can understand why. It's really all about finding the right strain of cannabis optimized for phytochemicals for the right patient and health condition, given in the right dosage form and given at the right dose. So as I draw this talk to a close, and speaking as a member of the UIC Scientific Advisory Board, I wanted to highlight that UIC is fervently committed to a high-quality cannabis cultivation and manufacturing industry in Australia, with the main mission being to supply high-quality cannabis to the sick and suffering that need it. As such, I wanted to discuss some key points that are important for consideration and form the backbone of our core beliefs. Firstly, we support the use of both indoor and outdoor growing facilities for the cultivation of medicinal cannabis. Certain strains certainly do grow well indoors, whereas others grow rather tall and flourish outside. Under natural sunlight, uh, which is uh, how they've evolved over millions of years. Outdoor growing is also naturally more resistant to fungus and much more environmentally friendly. For those worried about the security of outdoor grow operations, large greenhouses utilizing supplemental lighting can certainly be considered as a workable and proven solution. We encourage an open and transparent process involving many stakeholders to help come to such decisions. Secondly, we're passionate about the use of sustainable organic cultivation methods. Being an inhaled and ingested medicine means the raw herb must be as clean and pure as possible. Using more So using more natural agents, not only in pest control, but also in soil preparation, is also both environmentally sustainable and environmentally responsible. Third, we absolutely advocate for the use of naturally occurring cannabis species, land races and hybrids for medicinal use. We should not be restricting medicinal strains to certain strains as every patient and condition is unique. And we should also be encouraging cannabis plant breeding projects to continue research and improve strain development in a natural way. We do not support genetically modified cannabis in any way, shape or form. So lastly, we do not advocate for the laboratory manufactured synthetic cannabinoids. This is not because of lack of evidence. We simply continue to support the use of dried, flower, and crude spectrum, full spectrum extracts, the way it's been used for thousands of years, and would encourage researchers to investigate these dosage forms with as much earnestness, please, as they do single active extracts. So as I scroll through the over 60 scientific references that I utilize for this talk today, which is actually represents a mere drop in the ocean, I give thanks to the hundreds of researchers working around the world that have contributed to getting us to understand this plan a little better. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here, guys. We just need to perfect it. So when I get to this last slide, finishing up with a quote. So have a read of that. Let's finish with this. So when I first read this, it made me think how truth is incredibly persistent, but in a patient way. No matter what you do to it, it always finds a way to show itself. We don't need to defend cannabis. Both science and patient outcomes will do this naturally. All of us have a unique opportunity here today, as it's you that represent the keys to releasing this lion from its cage. Keep an open mind, educate yourselves, and let's work together to achieve two things. Let's bring this, queen, this green queen back out of exile and by so doing return some dignity and hope to those that need it most.
So my warm-up duties are now done. I uh, know it's been my sincere pleasure to shed a little light on the potential for this truly dynamic plan. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Justin. And uh, just before you go, Lucy has a small presentation for you. That was uh, absolutely wonderful. I'm exhausted. I, I just can't believe how much knowledge this man has and how lucky we are to have him on our scientific advisory board. Thanks, Justin. And uh, on a more personal note, I'm incredibly impressed with the number of large words you used during that talk. 